All right, that is the molecular orbital uh, theory diagram for the beryllium 2 molecule, and the last thing that we have to do here is calculate what the bond order is. Okay, so that is going to be the number of uh, bonding or electrons, number of electrons in antibonding orbitals, and uh, uh, divide over 2. Okay, so that is the sigma 2s. Okay, uh, we have 2 and 2, 4 electrons in bonding orbitals, and the antibonding orbitals, we have 2 and 2, 4, so the bond order is going to be 4 minus 4 over 2 is equal to 0. Molecular orbital theory predicts that uh, there's actually not a covalent bond in the beryllium 2 species, and we actually know that that is true. So uh, molecular orbital theory is, is successful in explaining the lack of uh, covalent bonding in the beryllium 2 species. Uh, next, what we're going to do is uh, continue to go down the uh, rail and the second rail and think about boron, carbon, and so forth. Now, this, this third here is going to change a little bit because when you have uh, boron, carbon, and beyond, you have electrons in p orbitals. Okay, so the electronic configuration is going to involve occupation of the two p orbitals. And then we have to talk a little bit about how these two p orbitals, uh, atomic orbitals, are going to mix to generate bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, much as we have, we have done for the s uh, orbitals. Okay, so just to put things in perspective, let me remind you of how this works for the s orbitals. What you have is that, well, this will be your uh, a atom, and this will be your b atom. Okay, and these are the wave functions, which are uh, generally positive. Okay, when you form the bonding combination, you just have that the uh, molecular orbital, which we we'll have called sigma, uh, is just going to be uh, the first wave function plus the second wave function. And there's a normalization constant here, which again, we don't worry uh, about. So if you actually draw how that would be, you'll have in the molecule A, B, and the sum of these two wave functions will be a constructive interference between uh, uh, two waves that is going to give you um, that wave with a positive sign. Okay, so obviously this is a bonding configuration because you have electron density in between the atoms. Now the anti-bonding configuration is going to be uh, this. That is the 1s orbital and that is the 1s orbital for B. But now the linear combination is going to be like this. And tie the wave function is just going to be the normalized constant and then uh, this. Okay, so effectively what it means is that, well, if this wave function is positive, then this will be negative. Now you're going to have a destructive interference. So when you bring these uh, two molecules, to, uh, two, two atoms together to try to form a molecule, what is going to happen to the electron density is that you're going to have something like that, and then something like that. Okay? Obviously, there is a molecular orbital that has a node in the middle. There's no electrons that can be in between the two atoms, and that is not going to lead to bonding. Instead, it's going to be an anti-bonding situation. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a, a, a quick explanation for how these bonding and antibonding orbitals are when you involve S uh, atomic orbitals. But the question is, well, what happens, uh, or how do we rationalize this when we have P uh, atomic orbitals? Okay, so uh, let's see the possibilities here. There will be a regular uh, 2P uh, X, for example, atomic orbital in atom A, and a regular 2P in atom B. And the possibilities are two. This can bind uh, or interact constructively or destructively. The constructive interaction that is going to give a sigma uh, 2p uh, bonding is going to be a normalization constant and then uh, this. Okay, so uh, this is going to be positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay, when you do that, what's going to happen is that uh, the resulting molecular orbital is going to be something like this. Positive, negative, negative. So notice that there's in the wave function of the molecular orbital of the bonding sigma 2p molecular orbital, there's actually electron density in between the atoms. That is, a bonding situation is very stabilized and the orbital is going to be lower in energy than the atomic orbitals. You can also form the anti bonding uh, uh, molecular orbital, okay, in which what you're going to have is n is going to be sigma 2 psi 2p minus psi. Uh, 2p here for the other atom. Okay, so uh, how would this uh, uh, turn out to be? Well, what you would have in this case would be something like this. Uh, this is your atom A, this is minus, this is plus, and then B is going to be exactly the same uh, way as before, but now it has a negative sign. Okay, so you just flip the signs that you had initially. Okay, when you try to mix these two uh, wave functions, you notice that there's going to be a destructive interference. And the way that you can try to draw uh, these molecular orbitals is going to be something like this. Okay, 
Okay. Clearly, there's a node in between uh, uh, the two atoms where electrons are never going to be, and that's what we call an antibonding orbital. Okay. It's going to be a psi. Uh, the wave function is going to be a sigma two p antibonding. Okay, but this is actually not the only way where uh, p orbitals can interact. Okay, what we actually have here is a mixing of the wave functions that is head on, but there could also be a mixing of the wave functions that is side on. Okay, so let's try to uh, uh, see how that would work. Okay, so instead of uh, picking here the uh, 2px orbital, we could actually pick the uh, 2py orbital. Okay, one that is perpendicular, and then you would have here this would be uh, the orbital and that would be the orbital. The question is whether these uh, two-way functions can mix to generate two molecular orbitals, uh, one bonding and another bonding, in the same fashion that we have seen for uh, S orbitals and the two P uh, orbitals that are uh, in between the atoms. Okay, so you will see that this is actually not difficult to do. It's exactly the same as before, uh, but now these orbitals are actually going to be called pi orbitals because notice that the interaction is actually going to be side-on as opposed to head-on. Okay, in the bonding situation, uh, it's just, this is just going to be uh, equal to a normalization constant, then uh, psi 2p plus psi 2p. Okay, so this is exactly what you would have with a positive sign between them, and the resultant molecular orbital is going to be something like this. Okay, there's going to be a constructive interference between those waves, and you're going to find a molecular orbital that looks like this, plus and minus. Obviously, there's electron density in between the atoms. It's not right along the nuclear axis, but it's right in between the atoms. There's no nodes uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this orbital, right? Uh, so that's clearly a bonding situation, and this is how a pi molecular orbital would look like. Uh, how, would the, how would the pi anti-bonding orbital uh, look like? Well, it would be uh, very similar to this, but instead the linear combination is gonna be something like that, two pi star, this is going to be n, but then when you form the uh, linear combination, there's going to be a coefficient of minus one in front of the two orbitals, which effectively means that what you're doing is just uh, reversing the signs here. Right, so now these two waves cannot uh, interact constructively. Instead, what they will do is interact destructively, and the resulting molecular orbital is going to be like this. Right? Notice that in this situation, there's actually no electrons in between the two atoms. There's, there's a huge uh, uh, nodal region right here, uh, which gives rise to an antibody in orbitals. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do next is, is try to uh, put all this knowledge into a molecular orbital diagram so that we can actually see how uh, the MO diagrams for atoms like uh, boron-2, carbon-2, nitrogen-2, and so forth are. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that. All right, so uh, for boron, the electronic configuration will be helium, and then you will have 2s2, 2p1. Okay, so when we draw the molecular orbital uh, diagram, here's your energy axis, and then at the very bottom, you would have the 1s orbitals uh, forming the uh, sigma-1s and sigma-1s star orbit molecular orbitals, but we're just not going to draw those because otherwise the, the molecular orbital diagram would be uh, too large. We're just going to focus on uh, starting with the 2s, Okay, uh, and then following on with the two Ps. Okay, and again, uh, the part of the uh, molecular orbital diagram that is below would be exactly the same as what we have in helium two. Okay, no, no changes. All right, so that will be your boron atom, boron, and this will be your boron two molecule. Okay, so we know uh, how the diagram works like here, like, uh, right here. You're going to have here a sigma 2s bonding orbital and a sigma 2s antibonding orbital. And the electron occupation is going to be like this. Okay? Now, when you take a look at the. Um, this orbital is that it's going to be a 2p, 2p, and this will be the electron occupations. Okay, so what we actually have learned uh, just now is that, well, Two of those orbitals, the ones that are uh, along the same, along the nuclear axis, they're going to be able to give rise to a sigma uh, uh, bonding and a sigma anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay, sigma 2p and sigma 2p. 
that will be bonding and anti-bonding. Again, this will be two of these orbitals, whichever they, they are. Okay. Now, what about the other ones? Well, the other ones you're going to have a pi type of mixing and another pi type of mixing. Okay. So from these four uh, pi, sorry, p uh, atomic orbitals, you're going to generate four pi molecular orbitals. Okay. Two of those will be bonding, and two of those will be anti-bonding. Now, a question is, well, what is the relative energy of the uh, pi bonding orbitals with respect to the uh, sigma and the pi antibonding orbitals with respect to the sigma? Okay, so here comes something interesting, and that is that it actually depends on the atoms. Okay, for boron 2, carbon 2, uh, and nitrogen 2, the pi bonding orbitals are actually below the sigma 2p orbital. Okay, so that would be uh, the pi 2p, one of them, and the pi 2p. If you want to be thorough with the um, uh, labels, we would say that, well, if this is the sigma 2px, that will be the pi 2py and the pi 2pc, uh, where this tells you the atomic orbitals where those molecular orbitals come from. Okay, so here you will have your um, molecular orbital diagram, and uh, regardless of whether this is boron, carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen, or fluorine, what happens is that the pi uh, antibonding orbitals are always below the sigma antibonding. Okay, so that will be the pi star 2py and the pi star 2pc. Uh, okay, so uh, we have now our molecular orbital uh, diagram and we just have to fill this up with electrons. Okay, so here we're going to have two and two, four, five, six total electrons that we have to put in the lower energy molecular orbitals. That's where the first two go, that's where the other two go, and that's where the last two go. Okay, we have a total of six electrons. Okay, so the electronic configuration of this molecule will be, well, two electrons in the, uh, for boron 2. What we would say is that, well, this is exactly the same electronic configuration as helium 2, and this is what this KK means. And after that, what you actually have is that there's a sigma 2s that is doubly occupied. There's the sigma 2s antibonding, which is also doubly occupied. And then what you have is that, well, there's one electron in the pi 2py and one electron in the pi 2pc. Okay? All right. Uh, we can also calculate uh, the one order right here, and that's just done the same way as before. And what you actually find is that, well, there's a total of six electrons, and then we have these two are in bonding orbitals, and that one, uh, those two are in bonding orbitals, so we have a total of four electrons in bonding orbitals. And then we'll have two electrons in antibody orbitals. Okay, over two. This gives you a bond order of one. Okay, so in principle, boron two uh, should be a stable uh, molecule with a covalent bond. Something very interesting happens, though, in the uh, orbital structure. And what you actually have seen is that there's uh, the total number of spins, the current spins that are up, is not perfectly balanced out by the number of spins that are uh, pointing down. You actually have that there's two more spins pointing up than uh, pointing down. Okay, when you actually have this unevenness between uh, spins pointing up and pointing down, you actually say that this molecule is uh, paramagnetic. Okay, uh, and it actually uh, can be affected by an external magnetic field, as we will see uh, when we talk about NMR. Okay, so all of the molecules that we have seen until now, until uh, uh, boron 2, they actually have the same number of spins up than spins down. When you actually uh, have the situation, we call those molecules diamagnetic. But in this case, you have uh, two more spins uh, up than down. We call that molecule paramagnetic. Okay. So what the the rest of uh, uh, the lecture today is just going to be uh, dealing with continuing down the periodic uh, table. We're going to look at carbon two. We're going to look at nitrogen two, oxygen two, and fluorine two.